everyone today we are going to talk with Chris the US design lead the mentors and the consultant for product development about what's the importance of UX especially with product development mm-hmm. what is a key personalities that make the very successful US designer and in the end I believe this very interesting topic that Chris may open with you about the uh, interviews mm-hmm. what is the key ingredient that he may add for finding the right US designer in his team perfect let's get started yep let's get started yeah so I'm Chris I've been a UX designer for the past eight years I've worked at product companies and also consultancy where I met Swan uh, we worked together for about two and a half years and I spend most of my time now mentoring training and hiring UX designers so kind of getting a bit out of the craft of UX but really a design leadership role so yeah today as you mentioned you're gonna ask me some questions about UX yes. and uh, I'm gonna try and help you guys answer some and hopefully clarify some miscommunication misalignment whatever the uh, I guess um, how do I say it? whatever the vague thing about user experiences because I think Um, a lot of industries out there that they don't quite know and students don't quite know so let's dive into it yeah. yep absolutely thanks okay so i think the very first question is like people may heard about ux mm-hmm. but they don't really understand what is the importance of ux into the software development especially with the product development so i think let's start with that one okay so the question is the importance of ux in product or yes. software development yes Ah, oh, this is a <laughs> this is an easy one. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, of course, it's really important. Um, I think typically, let's just say, 10 or even 15 years ago, it, it was sort of engineering-led culture, right? Software yes. development because it's all about code, and um, we know now, uh, in the past, however many years, that UX is so key because basically, why it's so key is because the cuts the customer touches it right yeah. is what the customer sees and what how they interact with this product so yeah it is a fundamental pillar of software development so if, if I was to draw a Venn diagram mm-hmm. three concentric circles that overlap which is its product slash business and then its user experience and then it's the tech or software engineering right side and in the middle is really the what the customer wants and needs and Without those three circles and those three practices, mm. I don't think you can really create a successful product, a well-loved product. So it's just uh, fundamental. And if you don't have UX in your product development cycle, if it's an afterthought, then the customer can always see it and they always know that they haven't, this company hasn't spent enough time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I start with that easy question is because our Uh, for me, mm. uh, honestly, US is just come to my mind uh, recently five years ago, and before that, mostly when uh, we start with like mostly is outsourcing mm-hmm. project, we know about UI design, mostly about like like some design for Photoshop or something like that. Mm-hmm. And what is the big difference between like UI design and UX? What is the key mental things for making that change? into the software like development cycle um so okay so let's break down that question into a, a few pieces so the first one is like ux and then it's ui what is the difference right the difference is that the ui you're focusing on what the customer interacts with so if you think about it uh, it could be like um, any sort of interface whether it's physical or whether it's digital. So you can think of like a light switch is a user interface, mm-hmm. it's a table is user interface, right? So what the customer actually touches uh, and interacts with. And then the UX part is like, like what are their needs? Like why do we need to build a light switch? Like because they want to switch on the light, because they want to illuminate their room. Uh, why do they need a table to put a drink on, to put a mic on? You know, so it's the fundamental need and discovering the problems. And therefore, yeah, you brainstorm some solutions and then the UI designer sort of takes those needs and then makes it the interface on how people interact with, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, the second part of your question was, mm. remind me again. 
like for what is uh, the gap from uh, mm-hmm. having the UI design and US design to the like product development? Uh, so, so the gap between like just UI designers mm-hmm. and then like and UX designers, yep. right? Okay. Um, I think there's uh, like there's there's uh, of course there's like some knowledge around like how to do research, um, how to maybe test what what is uh, viable for the customers, mm. uh, and then there's like skill sets as well, right? Like if you need research, you need to know how to talk to people, need to write interview scripts, need to analyze data. Uh, not saying that UI designers don't do it, but they do it in a different way, right? Mm. And then. Um, Yeah, UI designers focus on things like micro interactions, uh, more of like the branding part of it, and really the look and feel, right? And, and um, basically, what the customer touches. UX, the customer will never really see that, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like the back end development, oh. art, right? It's much more easier. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you can imagine like UI is the front end development, mm. and then UX is the back end development. So that is kind of how they interplay. And um, mm. a lot of companies have the front end, but they don't have the back end of uh, of this UX field, right? They just have the front because they think that's all that you need. But actually, if you don't have a good infrastructure and system architecture, then your product is kind of shit, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. So it's all broken. So that 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 would be my analogy in the software development. Oh, it's honestly, it's very interesting. Like definitions, like back end, front end, especially for engineering. I may understand this a bit better when they like understand like how you guys work what is different between like when there's a member like cone us designer working in the team so this what what they are doing mm. and for mm. ui designer what's the difference mm. and like for that part like mm. from the engineering perspective yeah i just want to understand it a bit better like for the people who want to try it for uh, ux designer positions mm. what is the key personalities or attitudes that they may need Yeah, I think um, one of the ones that everybody says, and I believe it to be true, is that um, don't fall in love with your solution. Hmm. Because I think a lot of times when you design something, you you spend lots of time on it, and you're like, oh, this is really good, and then you put it in front of some people, and they just can't work it out, hmm. right? So it's it's not falling in love with your solution because it will have to evolve and change based on the need, right? So I think. Yeah, that's that's a key thing to to really like um, strive for perfection, but knowing that your design will never be perfect. Mm. So so that's a mentality that's really hard for a lot of people. How can you keep it balanced? Like strive for the perfect, but like understand that it never yeah. be perfect. Yeah, because like most designers, um, you know, whatever designer you are, you're you're like a craftsman, mm-hmm. right? You, you like build this really nice table, and you spend so much time on it but in the digital world um, you can build it a lot faster and uh, it has to adapt with the evolving needs and like if you build a table the table is finished and that's it right if the customer want to change it it's mm. really really hard but with software development it's super easy so and also you're kind of guessing what the customer wants based on your research so if uh, so when you release that product It's kind of like, oh well, if it doesn't work, then you have to change it, right? Mm. But but like the perfection is like trying to trying to really nail what the customer wants, or try to nail what the problem is with the uh, platform and how it better aligns to, like business goals, for example. So it's like you want to strive for perfection because you want to like really iron out everything that's wrong. Mm. Uh, but the first, but knowing that uh, perfection takes a long time and you might never get it right, but you're always trying to. Do that. Um, another thing is um, kind of learning a lot of things, like just learning and growth in general. Because with this fast-moving industry, I think like software development as well, it's like always like new tools, uh, new languages, uh, new things to learn, right? Um, yep. New industries like NFT and and crypto. So it's like for a UX designer, they really have to soak in like all the industry trends and figure out how they sort of navigate. Um, their knowledge of, of like designing, let's say, a NFT marketplace because mm. it's so new, right? So it's just all about learning. And then maybe the last one is uh, experimentation. Mm. Yeah, like like I said, there's so many new things. It's all. I think it's. I think yeah, you need to like try new techniques if like 
one thing doesn't work, do it again, uh, or try a different way. And, and this is that whole striving for perfection as well. How, how do you strive for it? You do it through experimentation, like just trial and error, trial and error. And, um, and then also that, of course, overlaps with learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just my curiosity, so yeah. I know like what is the day-to-day -day life from the engineering side, but how it looks like from the US design with all that you share, you share that how can you like, manage the time for experimenting things, yeah. like focusing on your products, do the, uh, like, the change mm -hmm. and like, do the research, how you balance all these things? Yeah, so um, like, I think like any other software development project or project in general, there's different phases, right? Mm -hmm. So day-to-day um, -day could be very different based on what phase. So you could be one day speaking to five customers and writing notes mm. uh, and recording the session. Uh, another day you could spend in your design tool, like just in Figma or Sketch and just kind of like messing about. The other day could be analyzing the results that um, people have used your product, like Google Analytics mm. or any of these other platforms where you get your results. So it could be varied, uh, of course, like meetings, like it's, it's just um, really depends on which cycle you are in the product development phase and how far you are to the end product. The, the closer you are to the end product, then you'll probably be in, you know, the design tool itself, tweaking it uh, and then analyzing the results versus if you're at the beginning, then you're actually like preparing scripts, interviews mm -hmm. and like running around trying to like do your research basically. Yep. Mm. It's uh, matching with the agile process, right? Yep. Yep. Nice. So when you're working with the like software development teams, especially with the the peers mm. who are uh, US designer in Vietnam, so what is your uh, like opinion about like the maturities of UX in general and US career in Vietnam? Yeah. So the, let's go for the maturity question first of UX design in Vietnam. I think. Overall, the market is fairly immature. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's definitely um, a percentage of people that kind of know the craft and have been doing it for years, and but it's still quite rare, uh, and it, it's not the same ratio as in US or Singapore or, mm -hmm. or, or any other of these more developed markets. So it's quite immature, but there's um, the good thing is that there's a lot of people in the community that kind of spread um, these best practices like design ops or or research best practices um, but typically you don't get the same roles in Vietnam that you would get elsewhere in mm. let's say let's say in a Google in the US they're much more specialized they're much more um, deep with their craft so like uh, let's just say uh, micro interactions would, would, would be from sorry micro interactions would be from a you know, motion graphic person mm. that also has UX chops, but here that just doesn't exist. That's just like the whole UI designer role, right? Mm. So yeah, I, I think it's more generalized here. It's usually UX, UI. So they want you to do everything. Yep. They don't want you to be a generalist, uh, but as Vietnam matures, you'll have to get more specialized. Companies get bigger. You'll, you'll have people going deep into the craft. Um, yeah. And the other part of the question was, Mm, like for US career in Vietnam, so yeah, uh, what is the chance for people? Like, let's say if they want to try with the US career, yeah. So, what is your uh, comments or your opinion about how it goes in Vietnam, like along with the software development and also a lot of startup companies and product, mm, like appears a lot in Vietnam. Um, what is my advice to UX designers who want to start? Mm. Or no. Can be let's say uh, because uh, you say that the US market in Vietnam is quite mm. mature, but uh, the specialist is quite rare. Mm -hmm. So let's say if one want to start their career as the US career, mm. and what should they start? Should start designing products. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they should do. Yeah, they should uh, soak in as much information as possible and basically either get internships or do work for free or work for very, very cheap. I think mm. that's always the best one. So either you could, uh, so yeah, that, I, I did a video on this like ages ago, mm. but like there's a few ways that you could like become a UX designer. One is like go to school 
and pay lots of money for it and either it's physical school or online and those things are quite expensive there's lots of free resources online so go there uh, the other is yeah internship um, which you get very little money anyway and then uh, the fourth one is uh, do personal projects or work for free right and and those mixture of the, all those things I never went to school for it I just did it um, so but you can do like now there's so much education around this field mm. uh, you can easily find that but the best way to learn UX is to do it because the education part of it teaches you like a process but with UX design there's no one process fits all so it's like if you don't do it over and over again and, and figure this out then it's very hard to sort of like um, just remember like the good practices in your head yeah mm. I really like the idea of like do it for free or try it them yourself yeah because uh, for me it sounds like the uh, take the scholarship from the market mm. like you you have the scholarship from the company or any product or startup companies for giving you the chance mm -hmm. for trying this acting the role mm -hmm. and after you learn from that and it's a practical lesson mm. it's completely different with the theory theoretical one yeah you learn from school and in the end you still need to differentiate what is the ways that you can apply it in your day-to-day -day job right exactly yeah it's like learning cs right yeah. uh computer science is highly theoretical and then when you're in the market and you're trying to build a web app you're just like oh well i know like <laughs> the concepts but uh, i don't know the, any of these languages uh, i wanted to take actually uh, a human computer interaction course for masters and masters is a little bit different it's more practical and you get to work with like these organizations so then i actually decided not to and just like well, if i spend two years in a masters why don't i just spend two years working and actually learning and earning money and i think that's the best thing also uh, a tip nobody cares if you like go to school for ux basically nobody cares like me being a hiring manager don't care i mean it's okay it's cool but like really is about the work you've done the experience in the field what you've worked on who you've worked with so it's really about the experience it's still a very um how do i say it mm, vocational job it's like it's a it's a doing thing it's it's like carpentry it's like it's like a, being a mechanic mm. yeah interesting point that you mentioned about like if you are hiring managers so I think it uh, would be a very interesting part for the audience mm -hmm. to understand like if you are the hiring manager, let's say if I'm the candidate today, what is the interview process looks like mm -hmm. for having you the right candidate for a US designer in your team? Okay, in, in my team specifically? Yes. Okay, um, well typically it's uh, online portfolios. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you apply, you should have an online portfolio. Nobody wants a PDF. Hmm. Right. Don't send me a video. Don't let, let me download anything. I just want to access it. So uh, typically, the recruiter goes through the portfolio, or we do. And then uh, in this market, you have to basically call people to validate if their English is good enough. Hmm. Right. And that's also from the portfolio. And then if if you get through those two rounds, it's usually a test. So just to test your chops, you shouldn't spend more than you know a couple of days on it, and mm. we don't really require you to. After that, we'll mark and grade the test. We won't let give you the results. If it's good enough, then um, we will invite you for an on-site. Mm. And then with the on-site, we kind of dig out like questions and stuff like around the solution. Why did you choose this? Why, why didn't you do that? Have you thought about this? just to see how they present their designs and can they back their solutions up. And also, do they always think they're right? Because they don't know they're right, but if they pretend they're right, it, it's kind of like, mm, well, mm. okay, this is not really what UX designers do because uh, taking feedback is such a huge part of our work. Yeah. Um, and during the onsite, so it's like, okay, we grade that sort of, or we ask you questions based on your design solution that you presented. But then we also test how quickly uh, you are on your feet how quick can you think so we typically give you like a whiteboard challenge right like design the solution in less than 15 minutes and then we sort of collaborate with you see how we can work together are you quick do you consider lots of things it's really to put a little bit of pressure there's also a bit of fun mm. you know whiteboard activities are typically fun then after that uh, we extend the offer so um, I know other companies do it a little bit different but that's typically the process that I go through
Okay. So honestly, I want to go a bit deeper into that like process because uh, mm. like I'm also uh, somehow acting at the hiring manager but for engineering. Mm-hmm. So uh, to identify what is the levels of the candidate, like the popular way is junior, mid level, yeah. and seniors. So the strategies from the engineering side, we may apply that know what, know how, know why, or ASK something, uh, some strategies like that. Yeah. So what is the strategy from UX side for having that definition of level from the candidate? Yeah. Um... Actually, it could get quite complicated. Really depends on how your company or team uh, validates what's important, mm. right? So we built up this matrix of like lots of different areas to to ensure that people get promoted holistically versus mm. if you're just really good at like prototyping, right? Uh, but uh, maybe the communication or spreading the good word of the company is also okay. So there's a, there's a whole matrix, but specifically on hiring, it's really about first their technical skills. So like how good they are UI, how good they are at uh, presenting their designs. Um, have they shown that they have research capabilities? Mm. So like all, all the sort of like uh, nitty gritty parts of it. Um, and then also high level, if, if you're more senior, then you might think about more the macro view, mm. like more strategic, like you know, um, what uh, you can propose like what this product can do or or understand sort of the industry as a whole uh, if you're more of a junior then you're probably worried more about the execution and like the flows or something like that right so we'll try and tease that out with uh, with questions it's very hard to do it on the test mm. right uh, but you can then say have you thought about this uh, how do you think that The, uh, Airbnb would design the same thing given that they have millions of users with lots of different languages. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's all about first grading the, the technical solution and how they come to it and then following up with like which level do you think they are based on what they've shown. Okay, mm. that's great to know. <laughs> like, it sounds much more complicated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, How about like your day-to-day interaction with like engineers? Because uh, I think it's also the important part to like convert the ideas into the real digital product, right? Yeah. And one other question uh, from me and also from some members that I used to manage, that there's a there's they want to know like from the engineering side, do yeah. they need to understand or learn or try to have the knowledge or the views from the US so that. First, it can have the collaborations from two different sides, mm. and after that, they can understand it, what you share with them regarding to the features, the product, a bit better. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think um, it, uh, best practices is involve engineers early, mm. people who are actually building what it needs to be built. Sometimes we might design solutions that are overly complicated or yeah. just impossible, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, especially when product development is so like time sensitive. If you need mm. to ship in this quarter, you can't like go crazy, right? You can't do like an AR mm. thing. Everything's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like it's just like, it's impossible. So yeah, involve like interact, like the best practice of interaction is involve engineers early and each step of the way and make sure someone is senior enough to tell you that is it possible or not mm. because maybe the juniors will try it but they don't really know the business aspect or the time that it will take maybe they're just interested in it right so get a senior engineer uh, on your side uh, run them through you know what you're trying to do and really kind of handhold them through the process because i think one of the jobs of the ux designer is to basically collect every everybody's view and put it together and then translate that into like a tangible solution so that's how you do it and then for the other side of engineering's how much ux do they know i think it would only benefit their career mm. i think especially for like front-end engineers yes because they are actually working on things that customers touch if they don't know anything about best practices of ux or interactions it's very hard for them because they would have to they basically have to look at like static things and figure out how it should work mm. whereas like the ux and them should collaborate on how it should work because front end engineers will know the best practices of like uh, the web for example right and, and things like that or like material design and um so it, it should be really close collaboration so yet again at different phases of the project you'll have to 
be closer to the engineers. At the beginning, you probably don't have to be too close, involve them just a little bit at the beginning, sort of just get their blessing on what you're working on. And then towards the end of this, uh, or the middle to the end, it's like you're really delivering the product. So, and then you and the back end and the front end engineer should really be sitting in you know the same table and like mm. keep on going back and forth. And of course, we've like bug fixes as well, right? Like. Uh, designers are more detail oriented, I would say, than sometimes front end developers. Mm. So, there then, like you know, front end will need UX help, and it, it's really it, it's really like overlapping, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's also important, like from my perspective as the mm. manager, is like if the engineers they understand the perspective from the UX, yeah. one, so they can have the ownership on what they're doing. They not need to come to you or the manager or mm -hmm. the leaders for asking what should I do with these small things mm. so it's bring more complicated and also extended time for equipment and also it does not bring your own signatures mm -hmm. on the products right yeah that's true I think yeah front end developers des uh, deserve ownership of the product they're building mm -hmm. right like if, if the customers are touching it they should be the ones to be like I think this should be better this way or, I, or like why not right like it's never really too late to propose Uh, changes for the good of the product mm. um, so yeah that that's why you have to involve them when you're building a solution otherwise nobody just wants to execute right so, yeah interesting mm. so do you also remind me about a very like strange and like unforgettable experience when we do the uh, UX workshops mm -hmm. together in Westlife mm -hmm. so you want to share some things about that like what is the common practice for facilitated that workshop and was it the impact of having the US workshop and not having the workshop yeah. in the product like starting initial part? Yeah, yeah, UX workshops is, is something that I also discovered in Wiseline. Mm -hmm. But and then uh, it was very successful and it helped us basically convert a lot of clients into real customers, but also help the whole de uh, product development cycle. So without a UX workshop, a UX designer would basically like speak to people, like different teams, uh, kind of, uh, what's the word? Mm, sorry, let me just take a drink. Um, yeah, so the UX designers basically speak to a lot of different parties and trying to put all that information together. So I guess it's siloed. Now people mm. aren't speaking to it, like product and engineering aren't speaking to each other. Um, Customers and marketing, you know, have their view, but nobody else knows what they talk about, right? So, um, yeah, and then basically that UX designer will then say, okay, based on everything, someone needs to approve these decisions, and then I can then move forward, right? Usually, someone approves it's the product manager or the CEO, or whoever is the decision maker. Um, that's bad because nobody knows what you're doing, yeah. right? Nobody knows who said what and why. Uh, with UX workshops, it's like everybody gets in the same room. Uh, you can spend a few hours or even, you know, like a week together, right? Which we did, and you basically hash out everything that's uh, that you're thinking about that's wrong. Mm. And and a UX designer's job to to facilitate is to come up with activities that tackle a specific set of problems, where it's like understanding the user, right? Um, building solutions like what are the best ideas, um, voting on, you know, different themes or even creating um, themes based on what everybody said in the room. So there's a lot of these like tactics or activities that you run, and really depends on what the group needs. So mm -hmm. that's a that's another UX thing. It's like okay, well, what does this product need, and what sort of information or inputs do we need in order to get the best output? And based on that understanding and that workshop, everybody has agreed to move forward in a certain way. And if they object, too bad, mm -hmm. right? You know, everybody has agreed. Of course, it's not a democracy. Uh, there's still a decision making in the room, but to have that decision making in the room, say this is what. I want to do based on everybody's knowledge mm. and everybody's expertise. So it's really, really good, and it would basically save you a lot of time and a lot of effort to then go back and yeah. and change stuff. So it, it's just a, a fundamental practice that um, everybody should use. Yeah, yeah I think that I, I really engage in that workshop because I remember exactly like after that one, so everybody on the same page, and we made the decisions 
mm. as a team. Yeah. And it never had happened. The the situation is like we go back to discuss about the things that we agree before, mm. and it have the teams for going forward much faster. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. But for that one, I think like also the facilitation skill is like quite a really hard one to adapt with your situation, right? Yeah. So how how do you like gain the skill? How you like? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so facilitation. Basically, um, before Wise Light, I never like presented. Wow. Yeah, so like I didn't. I was just pretty bad at it. And then Wise Light just made you present because it was a product consultancy, right? Mm. So you always had to speak about what you're doing with the clients. And these are like major clients. Like the first one I went to, um, the first workshop that we did, uh, and it was the second workshop ever in Wise Light was to. 21st Century Fox in LA, mm. speaking to all these media executives, and I was super scared because I've never done it before. And Wendy was just like, "Oh, you should do it," and I'm like, oh, "Why? <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me!" And I did it. Uh, me, yeah. I, I can't imagine that you, you said that you never tried it before, but never. Wow. Yeah. So and then we did it, and it went successful. And after workshops, being a facilitator, you feel really good. Mm. That that feeling of like, "Oh, you did it," and, and you you know you help people and, and like. Um, yeah, you did your job really well. So we started doing that more, and then I basically got more and more comfortable, like speaking about, you know, my area of expertise, and also guiding a group of people to a common goal. Right, that's really the goal of the facilitator. Mm. So I, I think there's uh, a lot of best practices that you should do, but the number one is preparation. Yeah, yeah. So like, plan your activities well. And uh, know what you're gonna say, and uh, you know, look at the timing because a lot of a lot of things is all about timing, and um, yeah, preparation and structure. And then the other thing is, be prepared to throw everything out the window. <laughs> <laughs> so it's completely contradictory, right? Yeah. You gotta plan it well so you know it really well, and then uh, most of the time, in all of the workshops I've been on, something goes wrong. Right. So if you know the activity really well, then you can switch to something else, or you can kind of like guide, go straight into the activity, or think on your feet a little bit and change the activity based on what the people are saying in the workshop. Mm. And um, this uh, another example is like Wendy was like, okay, let's do this activity that we've never done before during a workshop, and we basically went for lunch in Australia, and we just looked at it uh, and then just read about it. And then within like the next, you know, half an hour, we started running this activity, right? And it was like, oh my god, this is crazy. Um, but then we did it, and it was actually most one of the most beneficial activities we did. So it's really like nailing what the problem is and what the desired outcome is, and then filling the gaps in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, and then the last advice is. Just keep doing it. Like it's all about practice. You got to practice speaking to people. Practice trying to get everybody to to this decision. And you know it's just really fun. And uh, yeah, just learn to enjoy it and and practice. Yeah. Okay. So can I consolidate it like like you prepare to be unprepared so that you can collect all the problems that can happen, mm. and in the end the target is for just for having the the best solution as we can mm -hmm. for the client or the group mm -hmm. of users that we are going to discuss with mm -hmm. that like purpose what we need to do is during the workshop we just fill in the gap yeah that's it as yeah. we can that's it like we're not there to say oh you should build this no you tell us what you build based on everybody's opinion mm. yeah yeah really it's nice one <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's fun Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think like it's coming for uh, like some personal like questions. So let's say, yeah. what is your plan for uh, the upcoming years, the years of tiger? Oh, year of the water tiger. Um, uh, continue to build products. Um, I'm working on a few things at the moment, and I want to do some more community events. Uh, We're doing it Yeah, we can do it together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I came back to Vietnam um, in, like last year, and it was like lockdown. Wanted to do more community events. We did some in Thailand, and uh, when I was previously here, we did a lot of events. Right, at Wise, like we did so many. So I just kind of keep on wanting to do that and um, see where that leads. 
I'm trying to, as a UX designer, I am trying to be more business orientated. Mm. So I'm learning a lot about investments and, and, and crypto just to be more holistic because I believe that Web3 could be something that's ubiquitous eventually. So how do you as a designer learn about that stuff so you don't get left behind? I think, um, yeah. And uh, to be, a, I think, a better design leader, you need business acumen. So you can talk to like CEOs or product people and they'll give you basically the same respect that they give CTOs or whoever, you know, chief marketing person. Mm -hmm. So, so that, yeah, that's what I'm focusing on now. Just things. Mm -hmm. So I wish you all the like, success and luck for all that upcoming plan for this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, any suggestions for the audience mm -hmm. for uh, the years of Tiger, especially with ones who want to try with US like career? Um, suggestions is just to do it. It's just to really figure out uh, what you want to do. Either it's helping a friend um, build a website or design an app just for the sake of it like if you don't like TikTok or Instagram what's wrong with it uh, what do people say out there and just figure out a solution it's really just have, having fun with it I think designers love their tools and, and get into their tools but you know if you want to be a better UX designer not UI designer then you have to do the other hard things like figure out what people want and what people need and do that research yeah. interesting so I believe that's very really benefit for the audience Mm -hmm. And I think like it's coming to like the end of the uh, the videos. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Chris, for joining with me today for the videos. And if you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to leave it in the comment below. And you can uh, send this uh, email to me or Chris, so I can have to deliver it to Chris for sure. I cannot give any answer for you. <laughs> So uh, I hope that the video today is bring you um, much more information and insight about UX and you may have a clearer understanding on that positions and how it goes and you want, you can try with it. Mm -hmm. The years of Tiger, you can try with like everything. Everything. Yep. So I wish you all have the great years coming and like all the success, all the luck and all the happiness. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye-bye.